<clears throat> okay, we will uh, end uh, the kinematic and start the differential kinematics today. Uh, the second lesson is also online. I noticed that uh, the projector is totally white, so I came back to the frame of the first lesson, and I just have to try to avoid to go physically there, otherwise I go out from the frame, okay? But now I have a, wear a wonderful red mouse here that should be visible from the registration. Okay, so what we have done uh, up to now, we studied a little bit uh, different uh, orientation representations, and then uh, we developed a tool in order to be able, starting from the joint positions, to compute position and orientations of uh, the end effector of a generic uh, robotic structure. What we are going to do today is first try to answer to this question. assume a planar tree link. I have this DH table. Basically, what I need is just to know the length, and I assume it's 20 centimeters each. Okay? And this is a zero configuration. Okay, so theta <coughs> is the joint variable, so here is one. I want to solve the inverse kinematic problem. So I, I would like you to do it uh, intuitively, just right now. This is the uh, position orientation of the end effect. Can you just draw a possible joint configuration such that the end effect is this one? Can you just do it? right now by intuition.
just by intuition, let us start from the last one. This is the end effect, or is the last link. So basically, this is the last link. Okay? Now, <coughs> I have to use the other two links to connect the origin to this point. Do you all agree that this is the solution? Is it the only solution? No. What is the other possibility? The other way means this one. Okay? Any other possibilities? They are not. Now, very simple structure, actually one of the simplest possible structures. And uh, we already have uh, two possible solutions to what is called inverse kinematic problems. With five, we could spend several days with five, or even more, okay? And this is a planar problem. So the inverse kinematic problems is not as easy as the direct kinematic one, okay? And we will uh, first uh, we will first uh, see few possible uh, solutions uh, for simple kinematic structures uh, that will make us understand why we do need to afford this problem under a different perspective that will be due next lesson, starting today with a, at a differential level, so at the velocity level, with specific calculus. If I give you a position orientation of the end effector, and I ask, what is the configuration that bring my end effector in that desired uh, pose? This question is not easy. Let us see, for example, the planar three-link robot. And uh, let us first give uh, the direct kinematic equations to our mathematicians he would try to solve by simply <coughs> an algebraic solution, by applying I mean, his knowledge about trigonometric functions, because we only have a sinus and cosinus. It's the only nonlinearity is made by sinus and cosinus. Actually, for the orientation, it's very easy, because now for the orientation, we simply have uh, the sum of uh, the three angles. Okay? Oh, I don't need to to use rotations or quaternions or whatever. I see the problem, say, okay, this is just the sum, one, two, three, and this is the orientation of the end effector. Okay, fine. Then I come back and I do what I did earlier. Ah, okay. I come back and I say, okay, this is the last link. So this point here is of interest in order to solve the problem. <coughs> and by manipulating a little bit the trigonometric function, we are not going to go into the details. Okay? I'm just giving the overall picture on one possible way to, to solve it, and you will clearly understand why this is not the path that we are going to select. Okay? So, okay, I have that cosinus of, the, of theta 2 is given by this expression, and then for the sinus, I already have... Uh, a choice, I have plus or minus square root of something, okay? So it means that uh, here I see that there are two possible solutions. And then for theta one, I have the similar consideration to do. In the end, I have all the three angles, 
okay, that provide us a possible solution. Another possibility is to afford with a geometric approach, but the solution is obviously the same, and uh, here we can appreciate uh, the two possible configurations that gives us a solution. Okay, not very convenient. I mean, we should, should not forget that it is one of the simplest robotic structures. This is not the way we can, uh, we can go. Unless the kinematic structure is so diffused that it does have sense to, pro to, to find for a genetic solution that can be used to several robots. And this is what uh, actually the industry uh, has done for some of uh, the robots. For example, if I do have uh, a robot with three links uh, holding a spherical wrist, uh, one uh, common approach uh, is to separate the inverse kinematics by assuming that uh, the wrist is providing the orientation and the old structure is providing the position. And then trying to solve it via algebraic solutions or geometric one. Again, I'm going to show you the equations. We are not going to use this approach. It's just to, 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 to make you feel what is the approach, okay? So the solution is to decouple and to have uh, a inverse kinematics for the wrist position and an inverse kinematics for the orientation, okay? For the spherical robot, I do have some uh, possibilities, and here there is the solution. We are not going to go into details. For the anthropomorphic, I just want to show you the draws of uh, the possible configuration for the inverse kinematics uh, of uh, only the position, not orientation, okay? Because position and orientation are decoupled. If you look at those two plots on the top, and uh, you see the shadow is, in order to understand this configuration, is apparently equal to the other one, except that all the three angles are rotated by pi. Okay? So those, those two configurations provide the same end effect of position. And those two configurations also, but with a different orientation. So if we are not interested in the orientation, we have four possible solutions to the inverse kinematics of the anthropomorphic robot. There are two kinds of problems. First, uh, I, I'm trying to... I'm starting understanding that uh, the number of solutions is something a little bit tricky. Could be zero, could be one, could be more than one. And then, uh, if for the same point I have more than one solution, uh, my control algorithms should be made very robust with respect to the possibility that uh, I select one solution for example, in a control loop, and for some strange reason, I select another one at the following sample. I, my structure will, would rotate, try to rotate in one sample. So I should pay attention at the way I'm handling the inverse kinematic problems. And we are going to build next lessons a way that is uh, uh, inherently safe and robust with respect to possibility of multiple solutions. Okay, spherical breeze, there is a, a specific solution. We are not going to go into details. Okay? So in the end, uh, depending on the number of degrees of freedom uh, of my robotic structure, if I want to solve the inverse kinematics for the sole position, my robotic structure has less than three degrees of freedom, I do have uh, zero solution. Basically, uh, if I have uh, 
a planar two-link robot and I assign X, Y, and Z, clearly Z cannot be solved, okay? If I have a, a three degrees of freedom and I assign only the, the, the position, I may have uh, more than one, more or equal one, so more than zero, finite. So they, the solutions will not be infinite, infinite, but finite, okay? Only in some part of the world space. And if I have a redundant robot, so the number of degrees of freedom of my robot is larger than the number of uh, variables to be controlled, the solutions will always be infinite in some part of the world space. Okay, that could be zero. It's, it's very easy. My arm has seven degrees of freedom. Okay, but if I assign a position that is on that wall, the solution is, is zero. Okay, so zero is always one possibility. But inside, I can have an infinite solution. Mm -hmm. And basically, those are infinite solutions. Position orientation in the factor is this position with this orientation. This is fixed. And those are all the infinite solutions that solve the inverse kinematics. Okay? If I'm interested uh, in the pose of the end effector, position plus orientation, the considerations are exactly the same, but with respect to six degrees of freedom. Okay? But if you look at the lines, they are all absolutely the same. So again, the concept of redundancy is uh, application dependent. The solution to the inverse kinematics are clearly application dependent. If I only need the position, or if I need position orientations, or if I need part of them, okay? As the example that we made Wednesday. Okay. So let us move to the differential kinematics and statics. Differential kinematics means velocities. We want to study the velocities of our structure. Okay, so the topics that we are going to study, this is a, a very big chapter in the, in, the, in, the, in the class, and I think that it owns the, the main concept in, uh, of this class of robotics, okay? <coughs> we are going to study here, the, the, the orange arrows here represent the angular velocity, a graphic representation of the angular velocities of the joints. And this is uh, a blue arrows that represent the velocity of the end effect. We want to study what is the relationship that relates the joint velocities with the end effector velocity. And in order to understand it, we need some mathematical background. So what we are going to do now is to build an object that is called geometric Jacobian. The geometric Jacobian is uh, a fundamental tool in robotics. It's really un the understanding of uh, this matrix, is a matrix, uh, is really critical in order to understand uh, the movement uh, or the dynamics of a robot. Everywhere you will have uh, the Jacobian appearing som somehow. Yes? This is the, the, ang the angular velocity. Yes, I mean, uh, it's the angular velocity, but just a graphic representation. We are going to see a little bit more in, in, uh, in the detail. And of here, you have linear and angular velocities, uh, but I would need to make two arrows, one for the linear and the other for the angular. We will see later. This is just... Uh, 
Sorry? This is simply a, a vector just to show we have a rotation around the, the axis and this is a one of the possible uh, one of the possible uh, uh, rotation direction okay and here the blue means I'm interesting on what's happening here but actually I have uh, two lines one for the linear velocity and the other for the angular one we will recap a little bit the main co I mean, the main concept uh, of angular velocity is just right now of course, the analytical Jacobian uh, is uh, strict relative to geometric, uh, we will see. And then uh, something very strange uh, uh, will arise, and we need to study the concept of kinematic singularities that can affect totally the behavior and uh, uh, performance of your controller. Okay? We will study the redundancy. If uh, we do have redundancy, for example, in our body, we do have it for a good reason. And the same is in robotics. If we build a robot with more motors than strictly needed, it means that this brings an added value to design, you know, to the, the economical engineering design. And we are going to study how to exploit the redundancy. Okay? Then uh, we will uh, discover that the inverse kinematics at the differential level is something that we can handle not more easily because it will not be easy but more efficiently okay? and we will study some <coughs> algorithms uh, the project for Maya and mechanical engineering students will be on this topic obviously embedded all the others but will be on this topic how many mechanical engineers do I have now? No, no, mechanical Four. No, you are not. You are, you are Erasmus. <laughs> Always Erasmus. You, you will be Erasmus until the end of the class, okay? Four mechanical engineering. So we, lo we lost already several of... Uh, of, uh, of okay. Then we will study the statics. So um, the same uh, object, uh, the Jacobian, is also useful to represent uh, how the force project along the structure. What does it mean? Uh, I have uh, a weight on my end, and this is a, a linear force applying to the end effect. So in order to hold uh, this object, it means that I'm compensating this linear force with a linear force that is opposite to this one. Of course, I don't have a linear motor here, but I have uh, several motors along the structure. How do I select the couple? This is a linear force expressed in Newton. Here I have torques for couple torques in Newton meters. How do I select the torques at the joint in order to hold the bottle? The relationship will imply the use of the Jacobian again, okay? And so we will study how the Jacobians will also be useful in order to understand the forces at the end effect how they do propagate along the structure. This is very important. If I push on the, on the table, now let, let us pretend that this is fixed, okay? I'm not using any force by my motors, by my muscles. All the force here is uh, just propagated and dissipated along the mechanical structure. So unless some bones break, but I don't need anything, and the same is for the robot, is the opposite for this linear force, okay? Here I need motors, here I don't need. This linear force is just propagated along the structure. So it's very useful to understand the way the forces uh, propagate along the structure. The velocities and the forces. And this is what we are going to do in next lesson. Several lessons okay, are needed in order to 
to study this, it will be really the core part for Maya and mechanical engineer in Erasmus. Okay? For you, much more stuff will, uh, will arrive. Okay. Our, yes? With the forces. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, you have to wait a couple of weeks to discover it. <laughs> well, uh, statics uh, uses uh, the principal, the, the, the principal works, uh, virtual works principle. And so, I mean, there is a relationship. Uh, I agree with you. Kinematics is velocity. is not... Uh, forces unless you are in a static configuration and, and then you can make some consideration okay we will see later on but yes it's a, it's a, a correct question okay so what we would like to do today is to compute a matrix that given the direct kinematics so we are able to compute this homogeneous matrix, 4 by 4, okay? You are going to do it next Monday uh, at the uh, computer. So we have this one. We want to compute a matrix that has uh, six lines and uh, n columns, where n is the number of joints. But this is not... Uh, a square matrix, unless our robot uh, has six columns. Okay. Generally, this is a rectangular matrix. If if it is redundant, I have more columns than rows. Okay. This geometric Jacobian is composed by the first three rows are the rows that transform the joint velocities to the linear and the factor velocity. So here, the dot symbol on a variable represents the time derivative. I think this is more or less universal convention. Okay? This is uh, a linear velocity. We will uh, just have the equations for the well, definition of linear velocity next slide, but I hope this is not needed. And now here, I have a matrix that represents this mapping from joint velocities to linear velocity. Now, here there is an assumption. The fact that it's a matrix uh, has not been demonstrated yet. We will build and see that it is a matrix. Okay, actually. Because we could have... Uh, a generic F. No, we are telling something very precise. We don't have a generic F. We have a matrix. So, a specific kind of function that relates Q dot to P dot Q. I left some room here. Why? Dependency by who? The configuration, okay? I want to stress here my Jacobian will change with the configuration. But this is very intuitive. Planar to link. I have uh, Q dot one, Q dot two. And for example, this is uh, P dot E. Okay? Graphically. Pure intuition. But if I change uh, Q2 by keeping the same velocity, This vector is different from this vector, clearly. 
even if only the orientation. So this mapping is configuration dependent. When there is the dependency by Q, the terminology, this is configuration dependent. So it changes with the robot configuration, so with the joint values of the robot. Which one? Q is a dot. Q? Q? Yes. Ah, Q dot is the time derivative of the joint. So it's of the joints. Yes, yes. So the time derivative of a matrix, whatever it is the matrix, I just use A, is the matrix element is at the time derivative of the corresponding element. Simply that. Okay? And this is true also for vectors. So when I write Q dot, this is equal Okay? Basically it's, uh, it's just I mean Matrices are just a way to compact notations and operations. They don't, I mean, develop new concepts. Matrices are just a compact way to do operations and to see stuff. Okay. Then we do have also the angular velocity, always three. No matter what is the orientation, representation we are using. Because angular velocity is a physical concept, always has three components. Okay? That's the reason why I can write here six. This is six by n. Okay, so we will use this notation. V e will be a six by one velocity vector collecting linear and angular. Very often we need to have compact representations in robotics and very, very often we will use uh, in the same vector quantities with different unit measurements as this one. It's very useful because in this way you will see that uh, a lot of equations will be very compact and with a very strong, let me say, uh, reading of, of the equations. On the other hand, uh, it's also dangerous because if you, when, it's dangerous when uh, we go on the implementation uh, part because meter seconds, radian seconds, uh, we have different numbers, okay? Newton, Newton meters, uh, and we collect all together. We should pay attention in the proper places. Okay, so the Jacobian is this one. And uh, the second practice lesson will be the computation of the Jacobian. So you will write uh, a function, MATLAB function, in input uh, the joint position, in output a matrix. And this will be useful for the following, for the project. Uh, I wrote you a, a, a message yesterday in classroom. Do not download any code, okay? <coughs> We are going, starting next Monday, we are going to talk about the code and I'll, I'll explain you how I, how I will uh, you know, help you in developing your, your bricks for the project. And this year we changed a lot of stuff. So we are going to harmonize uh, the, the practice with a possible master thesis so using the same structure as we have in the lab. So there is no back compatibility. Okay. So we need uh, first three concepts before being able to compute 
the Jacobian. Okay, the time derivative of rotation matrix. How many of you have seen the time derivative of rotation matrix? I think no one. Yes, you. Where? Physics, okay. Uh, what is your bachelor? Physics, okay. Any, any other physicians here? You? A bachelor in physics, but you haven't seen the time derivative of rotation matrix. No? Okay. Ah, yes, okay. Then uh, the velocity of a generic point of a body with respect to a frame, and I expect that uh, all of you saw the equation. And then uh, specific to robotics, how do velocities propagate along the structure? We need to study how do they propagate. It's a little bit boring from the notation aspect, but the, the, the concept, I mean, are very, are very basic, is, is physics, is, is really composition of velocities, okay? Uh, let me be a little bit no, quick here. The velocity of a point, this is the definition of the velocity of a point uh, in 3D. And when I do compute the velocity of a point P, and I have to compute the uh, limits for delta T going to zero of uh, the, the, the increment over the delta T, uh, the result is tangent to the trajectory, okay? So here, in this draw, the result is uh, aligned, is parallel to the unit vector that is denoted with the letter T here. Then, the cross product. If I have two vectors and I need to make the cross product, uh, you can use whatever you want, your ends, but just pay attention to the convention. The results is a vector that sees the first one superimposing the second one in counterclockwise direction. So here, C is the result, A and B are the two components, and so the, the result lies on the um, normal to the plane that is composed by A and B. The, the amplitude uh, is the area of, uh, of this uh, uh, rumbo. <laughs> and then uh, the direction is such that the first, it sees the first superimposing the second in counterclockwise direction. And you can use the two ends, it depends from you. Then the velocity of a point in rotational motion is P dot equal omega cross product P, where omega is uh, the angular velocity of the body, and P is the vector position from the axis of rotation to the point of interest. And then uh, the linear velocity is clearly tangent uh, to the path, in this case is tangent uh, to the circle, okay? Very basic, uh, we can move on uh, quickly. Okay, now the time derivative of rotation matrix. We start from uh, the property that we demonstrated. R, R transpose is equal to the identity matrix. Okay, this is the identity matrix three by three. And uh, if we make uh, the time derivative, for uh, the right-hand side of the equation is clearly zero because it's uh, the derivative of constant. And here I have the derivative of a product. It can, can be demonstrated that for matrices, uh, the rules uh, is uh, similar to the time derivative of the product of two functions. So it's the, the derivative of the first one multiplied by the second uh, not uh, not derivated plus the first one not derivated <laughs> multiplied by the time derivative of the second. 
So we have R dot, R transpose, plus R, R dot transpose equal zero. And then we define a new matrix R as R dot and R transpose, and we find that here we have S, R dot and R transpose is equal S, and this one is actually the transpose. Okay? We should remember that Actually, S plus N transpose equal zero means that S is antisymmetric. Okay, this is the definition of antisymmetric matrix. And an antisymmetric matrix has a, a specific structure in order to, I mean, exhibit this property. For example, the diagonal should be made by element zero, and each element of a, of uh, um, position i, j as opposite sign with respect to the element j, i, but equal module. Okay? So the structure of this S matrix can only be this one. Zero, zero, zero. Then I have a certain number here, position one, two, row one, column two, okay? If I go on the element uh, two, one, the module is the same, but the sign is changed. One, three, three, one. Two, three, three, two. This is the only structure that an antisymmetric matrix can exhibit. Now, what is left uh, undemonstrated, and uh, the details are, are in textbook from uh, really physics, not even in, 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 the, in the textbook of uh, Bruno, is that uh, actually those are the coordinates of the angular velocity. So this is uh, very significant. R dot is equal this matrix where the angular velocity arises, multiplied by r. This is the way we compute the time derivative of rotation matrix. Example, rotation around z, the simplest one. Do you remember the rotation matrix of this one? Derivative. 
plus elements? Minus sums. Minus sums. We are derivating with respect to time. It's not a partial derivative with respect to r. No, it's okay. So it's. is uh, the results of uh, r dot, then s is equal to r dot multiplied by r. But r dot multiplied by r, if uh, we just make the computation, is equal to this one. Look here, do we want... Let's, let's make just the first one, okay? Just to be sure that it's not a mistake. of those two matrices, three by three. I just want to check the first element. So the first element <laughs> is given by the scalar product of the first row, the first matrix, multiplied by the first column of the second matrix. Okay? Yes. And the result should be zero. Is it zero? Yes. Then it was, well, the second would, would have been more interesting. The second one is uh, this element here is the first line multiplied by the second column. And then here I have uh, uh, sine of square plus cosine of square this is equal to one. So the result is uh, here minus alpha dot. Here there is alpha dot because it's anti-symmetric. The result should be anti-symmetric, okay? So now, what we do have is the confirmation that the angular velocity we are considering is a vector that is aligned along z. Okay? So 0, 0, alpha dot. So we are just making a simple case in order to verify and the results that we have seen earlier. So now we discovered that uh, if I want to implement a cross product uh, from the pure operative uh, aspect, uh, I can also write it uh, as uh, the matrix S multiplied by a vector. Just a, an insight is 
nothing conceptual. It's just an alternative way to compute the cross product. Okay. Time derivative of a point expressed in two frames where the point is fixed to one of the two frames. So if I have uh, one frame on a table and then I have uh, a second frame that is attached to this rigid body, I want to be able to compute the velocities of all the points in the rigid body. And of course, they will be different in all the points. And the example here is clearly the case where you have uh, a point with zero linear velocity and uh, the linear velocity that changes uh, in this case increasing all along the radius of, uh, of, the, of the disk. Okay? Then let us make the computation. Here there are all the details so very quickly. The position of the point expressed in frame base, so zero, is equal the vector connecting the origin of the two frames plus this other vector, but I need to represent the vectors all in the same frame. So I need to rotate P expressing frame one, I need to rotate uh, and have it expressing frame zero. Then I apply the time derivative. So the time derivative of the first plus, this is the time derivative of product. So you have uh, rotation multiplied P dot one plus time derivative of the rotation matrix multiplied by the position vector. So not applying the time derivative operator. But the time derivative of a rotation matrix, I do know that is equal S multiplied by R. And then it means that if you look at this one, this is a, a cross product, okay? And this is simply a vector expressed in frame zero. So I can write this one as uh, a cross product. Uh, who is omega one zero? This is the angular velocity of the frame one with respect to frame zero expressed in frame zero, okay? So this is the mean of this angular velocity. Then, I shouldn't go there, and then why this term disappeared? By assumption, the point P is fixed on frame one. Okay, I'm studying all the point rigidly attached to the frame one. So it means that I don't have relative motion of this point with respect to this one, okay? The position is always the same. Okay, uh, just as a curiosity, simple application, I do have, uh, I want to compute uh, the norm of the linear velocity of a point of an LP. I don't know how many of you recognize this object, or do, do you have it at home? Yes? I don't. <laughs> I, I lost it uh, during all, all the movement. Okay, so clearly we do have in the origin the two frames superimposed with the same uh, uh, origin, okay? And clearly, this term is zero because this is uh, the velocity of the origin of the first frame with respect to the base frame. 
they will be always uh, superimposed. So this is the linear velocity, it's zero. And then I have the angular velocity. The angular velocity it, uh, is expre expressed by this blue vector here because I'm rotating around the z, the, the, the unit vector going out from the, the flame. And this is a 33 revolution by minutes. Okay, it's an LP. It's 3.1 radians seconds. The radius uh, is uh, uh, around 30 centimeters. And so the linear velocity changes from zero to one meter second. It's okay, as order of magnitude. Okay, so we know how to compute this uh, concept. We need to compute uh, linear and angular velocity along the structure, okay? And we are going to do it uh, after a small break. Uh, a small break, uh, at, at 10 we start, okay? So very small. <laughs>